Sail Disability Network Upper Peninsula logo. Picture of UP in orange with blue paint circle. Sail Accessibility Consultation Services Access for All logo. Green and blue words titled Access with exclamation point at end for all underneath. A sail conversation with Bill Botten of the U.S. Access Board. Three persons on screen in box separate boxes. Bill Botten in home wearing white shirt and blue tie. Sarah Pierkowski in office wearing blue sweater. Lucy Wilcox in home wearing red shirt and wearing glasses. So thank you for joining. I'm Sarah Pierkowski. I'm the executive director of SAIL, the Disability Network of the Upper Peninsula. And we're here joined with Bill Botten. Um, he is the training and technical assistance coordinator with the United States Access Board. And also we have Lucy Wilcox, our AD, certified ADA coordinator um, for SAIL. So I'm just going to have Bill introduce himself and a little bit more about what the Access Board is. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Lucy, um, for this opportunity to um, be a part of your program that encourages greater access to the outdoor environment and recreation facilities. My name is Bill Botten. I serve as the Training and Technical Assistance Coordinator at the U.S. Access Board in Washington, D.C. Um, I'll bring you back a little bit farther. In 1983, I was involved in a motor vehicle crash that um, I suffered a spinal cord injury and it left me a T4 paraplegic. I was uh, growing up on a, a small farm in central Kansas and working construction, and all of that suddenly came to a, a quick change in um, now trying to use a wheelchair and um, do the things that I've always loved and enjoyed. I was a very outdoors person at the very beginning, and um, I really struggled with trying to find avenues or opportunities for me to fish or hunt or um, even just go to the local community swimming pool in the small town that I was um, living in. Uh, the inaccessibility in 1983 really uh, forced me to um, travel on the street. There, there wasn't even curb ramps at that time um, in the community that I was living at to even get off of the street and onto a sidewalk. Um, I was very fortunate to get to go to graduate school and um, started working for a large arena and stadium uh, management organization in uh, the hmm. early 90s. And when the Americans with Disabilities Act came out, I, I worked in assembly seating areas and making sure that they complied um, with the new 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act. I was actually um, brought to Washington, D.C. to work on a new stadium and arena here in the District of Columbia. And it was there that I met my current boss, that's the executive director of the U.S. Access Board. And he invited me to come and work at the Access Board in 1999 to develop uh, accessibility requirements for recreation facilities. And at that mm -hmm. time, we were going to include eight different sections into a new chapter. And we were looking at amusement rides, boating facilities, recreational boating facilities, um, fishing piers and platforms, golfing facilities, miniature golf, uh, sports facilities, swimming pools and spas, and one of the most important ones in the recreation facility uh, requirements that I think is uh, play areas, uh, incorporating the access for young people to um, be integrated and participate in uh, play activities at their schools or community playgrounds. Um, from there, um, over the years, we finalized the recreation facility requirements in 2004. Um, they were brought then to the Department of Justice um, for their rulemaking process, and you know them now as the 2010 ADA Standards for Accessible Design that incorporate the minimum requirements established by the U.S. Access Board in 2004. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Access Board is an independent federal agency, a very small independent federal agency that writes accessibility requirements that affect every part of your life. Um, I spoke earlier about the requirements in the public right-of-way for curb ramps, um, the recreation facility requirements, but also the built environment requirements, those uh, requirements that allow you to visit uh, your state, local, city government facilities, but also places of public accommodation and commercial facilities. Um, we've also uh, modified or changed what the federal government and all federal land management agencies followed um, the Uniform Federal Accessibility Standard into the Architectural Barriers Act Accessibility Standard. And we harmonized um, those mm -hmm. two standards, the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Architectural Barriers Act, 
to make the minimum requirements for accessibility across the board so that people with disabilities, whether you're visiting a federal park, a state park, or your city, county, local park, that the requirements would be the same and that the minimum requirements for persons with disabilities to expect what that minimum level of access would be, um, would be across the board. Mm -hmm. And so that's um, just one of the things that the Access Board has done, but we also write minimum requirements for information technology, um, diagnostic medical equipment. Um, I stated the public rights of way and shared use path. Um, so the Access Board is continually working on um, improving access for, for persons with disabilities by continuing to write minimum accessibility requirements that then are adopted by a standard setting agency to become the code of federal regulation or um, your minimum requirements uh, for accessibility under federal laws. I, um, I since then in 2013 was the lead staff person on a rule that came out on um, for federal facilities on federal sites only um, that incorporated uh, pedestrian trails, picnic and camping facilities, viewing areas, and beach access routes. And we called that rule outdoor developed areas. Currently only applies to federal sites. Um, it doesn't even apply um, to grants and loans received by the federal government. But at this time, um, it applies to all federal land management agencies for any new construction or alteration of those types of facilities that I just named. Um, and so that happened in 2013 and um, was adopted very quickly by the Department of Defense General Services Administration um, to um, be the minimum requirements, again, for all new construction and alterations for those unique type of facilities. I, I'm an outdoors person. I use a manual wheelchair. Um, these, uh, these minimum requirements have allowed me to participate in um, events that my children participate in, whether it be a soccer match at um, a community mm -hmm. field, uh, a swimming pool and a swim meet at a um, country club or at a, um, a community pool. Uh, and it's uh, allowed me to um, participate in what I think is the most important part of life, and that is after work. Um, the time that you get to spend with your family and your friends and um, the time that you get to be you. Um, and so I'm very proud to have had an opportunity to participate in this rulemaking and increase the opportunities for persons with disabilities to participate in, in all those extra things. Uh, I'll just share with you briefly, when we were going through the um, requirements for play areas, I had uh, three small children. And at that time, it was very difficult for me to let alone get into the playground, reach the playground from the parking lot. Um, mm -hmm. but ever interact with my children in a play area. And when it would be time to go home, it was up to them to try to get back to the car or if they got hurt because I wasn't, I wasn't even able to get into the play area surface to even lend a hand. Um, now, as you know, there's minimum requirements for newly constructed and altered play areas that um, bring you from your site arrival point, your parking space all the way into that play area surface and allow you to interact and play. Um, you know, persons with disabilities um, a lot of times don't have the opportunity to interact and play at other people's homes and young people don't have the ability to run to their neighbor's house and play with their stuff and then come home for dinner. That you really, you really focused on trying to find an accessible space that you can participate in. And so oftentimes for young people that might be their community or school playground. And that's the only opportunity they have to be integrated unless you're playing in a parking lot or on, on the street. Um, and so it's so important that we incorporate accessibility in all aspects of our lives in recreation facilities to make sure that not only young people, but in my case, I was the parent with the disability just trying to participate and being a part of um, what my family was doing. Yeah, there's um, an obvious sometimes to me obvious like that would be part of that concept and I don't know if people really really understand like the playgrounds and they typically think oh it's for the child that lives with the disability versus the individual or the parent or the grandparent to be able to be engaged and safe and with them as well so I really appreciate you know that concept mm -hmm. we have a a local group that does work on some of that playgrounds basically right off of that same idea so 
it's it's great to hear that that was really well thought through on the concepts and putting that into those rules. I think it's so important um, for community leaders that when they're purchasing this type of equipment or providing these type of facilities that they get community buy-in, that you get you get advocates and you get participants and you get young people that are going to be actually trying to use this facility, whether it be a wounded warriors group, uh, disabled paddlers, or just a, a, a group as yourselves um, that advocate for access for persons with disabilities to make sure that the facilities that they're constructing not only meet the needs of the of the people they're trying to serve, but also that they meet the minimum requirements and that they are accessible for generations to come. Right. So important. You bring up a, an important point, Bill, about the need for advocacy. And here in the UP, that is something that we're working on. And know that we need family members um, who may not experience a disability, but who are sharing their life with someone with disabilities, but also the, the um, inclusivity that you're speaking about where this outdoor area is open kind of for all takers about whether you're the person with the disability and whether you're 75 or whether you're five, how is the environment going to be um, enjoyable? You know, accessible, yes, but enjoyable. How are people going to have fun playing together? Yeah. And how, how do people with disabilities interact with um, the rest of the community in these recreation facilities? You know, whether it's a, a community ball field or it's a school ball field, um, access needs to be provided to the boundary of each area of sport activity. So every single field needs a route and that route needs to um, be some, uh, an accessible route that permits somebody with a mobility device um, to be able to reach that destination. And so it, it's so important to look at um, each of the programs that are being provided by the community and make sure that they are accessible. And, and you know, this, this really comes back to two people with disabilities. It, it, you know, the law made it so that we have to be the enforcers. The law made it so that we have to speak up. And the law made it so that when, when you're being discriminated against, you have an avenue to take that, uh, that action. And so it's so important that when people see inaccessibility or experience discrimination through lack of accessibility, that they're an advocate for change and that they make their community, the areas that they're socializing in. If you're a parent and your school is gonna put in a new play area, whether you have a child with a disability or you have a disability yourself, we need to make sure that everyone can participate and come there, um, whether it's the caregiver or it's the child themselves. And so it's so important to get involved and to understand some of the minimum requirements. The Access Board makes it very easy for you to try to understand that. Um, we provide a series of guides, webinars, training opportunities, so that advocates and people that are trying to um, incorporate accessibility into the built environment have avenues to get that help. The Access Board also provides a technical assistance phone number that's available from 10 to 5 Monday through Friday where you can reach a live person and just ask an accessibility question. It's so important to make sure that when you're doing an alteration or new construction that you get it right the first time. Right. That nobody's going to have to come back and tear it out and do it right the second time. And so it's so important that when you have these large projects that are incorporating maybe a new play mm -hmm. service or um, you're trying to create a route to a recreation center or you're trying to create a new community swim pool that you understand the minimum requirements and incorporate those. And we all know that the minimum requirements sometimes don't go far enough. Right. That people need more than what the minimum says. And that's why it's so important to have, you know, your leadership in the community and other advocates to, you know, um, go beyond the minimums, you know, where, where parking's not enough to incorporate more, where, you know, it, the door's too hard to get open because we have to make it, you know, a, uh, a vapor barrier because we have such bad winters that the doors are just hard to open because um, there's this force. 
you know, the, the standard doesn't require an automatic or a power assisted door, but there's oftentimes that may be the only opportunity for people to participate. Yeah. And so looking beyond the minimums um, is so important. And recreation facilities, remember that just because those eight sections that I've listed earlier that are in the recreation facility requirements, you're creating something totally different, doesn't eliminate your obligation to make sure that it's accessible and usable by people with disabilities. That just because we don't call out specific requirements for that type of facility, if you're doing a, a Frisbee golf course or you've got some type of a challenge course, so you have some other type of athletic opportunity um, or sports opportunity, make sure that you're doing the best you can to incorporate accessibility even though that facility isn't specifically called out. Because remember that Americans with Disabilities Act and the Architecture Barriers Act are civil rights laws. They're more than just a construction standard. It's about having the opportunity for people to participate and use the, the, the programs and services and facilities that are being provided. And I do want to add here um, for our audience, I want to add a reality check that you may have tried to call various federal agencies and been on hold for the rest of your life or at least that day. Um, and my experience has been that the Federal Access Board, you deliver. Bill, I, I've called, I've gotten a phone call back almost immediately. Uh, I've been directed to the right person who I needed to speak to and that um, the website that you have and all this information um, audience will be um, on our website page for you to review um, after the panel and, and I think throughout uh, a set couple of weeks uh, of this project and, and that the um, website you have is actually navigable by people like me who Wonderful. are not high tech and really don't like being annoyed by a lot of extraneous buttons and uh, bells and whistles and just give me what I'm looking for and so I want I want our audience our, our people here in the UP to know that we can connect with a real person if that's what we need we can connect with standards that what I appreciate you're saying um, you may be doing something new but you may want this guide because you still want to think through the accessibility issues and the inclusiveness and this may be a good guide to help you think about those things. So. It's, always, it's always good to know what the minimum requirements are and then how your community is going to use those minimum requirements and how best you can facilitate even greater access by going beyond and incorporating universal design or other aspects of accessibility. Um, we also at the Access Board have the opportunity to get a written statement where you can ask us a question and we will respond by email. Um, we have technical assistance uh, accessibility specialists um, that are available every day of the week, um, except for Saturdays and Sundays, to provide technical information um, back by email, um, which is rare from a federal agency um, to get an email back about a specific issue. So there's lots of avenues through the Access Board. It's, it's access-board.gov to um, either get training um, on these. The Access Board holds a free monthly webinar the first Thursday of every month on another topic. We're actually going through each chapter, chap 10 chapters of the Americans with Disabilities Act and Architectural Barriers Act every month, a new chapter. July will be toilet and bathing facilities in chapter six. Then we move into the communication features that are so important and um, become such a, a necessity even now with touch screen information in, in the, um, the digital world. Um, uh, we move on to chapter eight and we're going to do two webinars on chapter eight because there's so many facilities involved in there. But the December webinar, what I wanted to highlight, the December webinar, the first Thursday in December will be the recreation facility requirements where I'll okay. be doing an overview of the recreation facility requirements. 
but all of our webinars are archived and free and you can get continuing education credits. So they're all archived. You can take them at your leisure. Um, you can still get continuing education credits even if you take an archived one. Um, so it's so important to um, look up the topic that you're trying to provide access for and make sure you got all the relevant relative information that you need and, and do it right the first time. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm as you're talking, I'm thinking about just how recreation focused we are in the Upper Peninsula, you know, with the vast amount of forests and waterfalls and recreation, kayaking and just being out, I mean, down to the fact like you were talking, we have a lot of baseball and softball leagues, um, people that just, we have such a short summer and opportunity time to be outside during the summer, but then you have the whole, you know, six, seven months of winter time where you're doing that right. well. So I know that recreation is so important to the Upper Peninsula residents. So it's really awesome to hear how, you know, where we can get that kind of information or where municipality, where leaders, where council people um, in different communities and townships can seek that information out. I mean, we would really like to be one of their first supports in that sense and resources so that we can connect them a little bit more. But it's, it's key in my, in my view, like you were saying, it's not just the participant, it's their families and friends that are coming to watch and be part of that community as well. Because I can yes. think of, you know, a dozen places that I've been where I know, like, you know, just because I see things from a perspective of maybe sitting in a wheelchair or using a wheelchair, that there's no way that you could get to a lot of these ball fields. Um, right. So, or just to be part of that community and enjoy that outdoor right. opportunity. So really and don't forget, that. yeah, don't forget your winter sports too. Right. You know, that right. there's, there's right. still a requirement to get to your winter sports, whether it's skiing or um, what, whatever you're providing it's yeah. skating. Um, there's still a, a requirement to get to your areas of sport activity, even in the winter. And that can be so challenging because now your sidewalks are covered up. You don't have a hard surface. How are we going to provide it over the amount of snow that we get or how do we maintain our accessible routes to these recreation facilities? I'd also like to say that remember that temporary facilities are also required to comply. Mm -hmm. And so if you're doing a, a festival or you're, you're doing some type of an outdoor activity, an art show, a car show, uh, something that you, you need to look at a carnival, your, your local fair, um, all of those um, facilities, even though temporary, are required to comply. Mm -hmm. And so look at how you're creating your accessible routes from site arrival. Where are people parking? How do I get through these events? How, how you know, I, I encourage most of these festivals to be put on the, on the parking lot. Make people park in the grass. Right. Um, put the event on the parking lot so that you have the hard surface so that people walk through their booths in the parking lot. Sure. Or the car show. Oh, the duh. Park. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's so obvious. And I, I know. And I hadn't thought about that. And, and also, their portable restroom facilities. If you're providing portable restrooms, remember, even if you only have one portable restroom on site, it has to be the wheelchair accessible unit. And it has to have a route to it. You can't put it up on the curb. Right. You, you can't put it up off the edge. It, it needs to be on an accessible route. So look at the temporary facilities you're providing. If you're out at the ball field and there's just one portable restroom, um, it needs to be fully compliant. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is we just did some site reviews um, for a city here in the UP. And our situation up here is most of our parks are old. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were built 40, 50, 60 years ago, and um, the, uh, to upgrade, to bring to standard. And we have, Bill, uh, and our audience, uh, just to point out, we have a team called the Ambassadors Team where we try to do these site reviews with individuals with different disabilities and individuals who may be temporarily able to working together. And we went to this really very nice um, a, a park and and it it clearly was a, a kind of a neighborhood park and had beautiful tennis courts um, had a very nice uh, ball field um, and uh, neither one 
had an accessible road to uh, so um our our friend who was with us who is a wheelchair user he said i i couldn't go and sit in the ball field you know by the seats and watch my stepson play um and i couldn't watch a friend playing tennis um because there's none so it's a real um concern here that we're still in existing facilities and trying to help um, people nudge toward kind of the minimum. What we have seen more of in the past six months is the handicap porta potties because parks are staying closed. So whereas before maybe they didn't have uh, a handicapped accessible bathroom. Since they only have a, a porta potty, they are doing handicapped. So there's actually been an increase uh, in access in that way. Good, good. It's mm -hmm. you know some of the things that you bring up are so important that uh, you look at you know you look at what the facilities that you currently have, and a lot of them may be existing. But you need to start identifying how we can make some of these programs accessible. Where can we find a tennis court that does have most of a route or that we can finish a route to? And then we can tell people, you know, this is where we know we have an accessible route and, and let people understand where accessible um, features are available in their communities so that um, you, you have this opportunity. You know, I would, I live in suburban Washington, D.C. and um, for me to play with my kids, the community playground and even their school playground wasn't accessible. We would drive 25 miles to a, a surrounding wow. community just so that I could get to a place called Hadley's Park, which was a playground that was constructed for a young girl that used a mobility device. And I could actually interact and play with my kids at that point. So mm. we would travel just to try find accessible features in outdoor recreation. And I think most people will, that they... They would rather get in their car and get to something that they know they can use than, um, than be, you know, not able to participate and be stuck near the parking lot and, and no opportunity. Well, you're bringing up a collaboration that SAIL is working with at least one of our counties, uh, Marquette County, our biggest county with the most residents of the 15 counties, and we are collaborating with Travel Marquette, um, which represents the um, hotels. They're, they're funded through a, a room tax. And they want to create uh, an accessibility guide in a positive frame that we can at least inform people who have accessibility needs, here's a guide, and here are the restaurants that will work for you without Once. any problem. You know, here's the yeah. part. And, and trying to facilitate um, the knowledge for what currently um, will be the best fit. Let me just say one last thing real quickly, and that is, is that there are checklists for recreation facilities that are available at this time through adachecklist.org. Um, adachecklist.org has uh, free checklists that are for the built environment, but I also have a whole series of recreation facilities that individuals could download and go to their facility and, and just do it themselves with a tape measure um, or a smart level and try to determine some of the minimum requirements in recreation facilities and outdoor developed areas. We also have guides on each one of the sections that I talked about earlier uh, that really bring the, the minimum requirements in an easier to understand language than following the code. Um, so look for the recreation facility guides and if anyone in your audience has difficulty, please call the US Access Board for Technical Assistance. We'll be more than happy to try help. Well, thank you, Bill. I know um, you're a busy man, and we, again, thank you, and we're grateful for your opportunity and your time to talk to us today, and thank you again for all your hard work <laughs> throughout the years to really help all of us, you know, understand and learn and keep more inclusive communities. So I want to... Well, I'm, I'm happy to participate in your program, and um, I know you guys are doing great work up there in the Upper Peninsula, too, and 
um, trying to make the world a better place for everybody to participate. And um, I thank your audience for participating in this and looking at how they can improve access in your own community. Remember, it starts at home. Yeah. Um, it starts at home and um, really try impact your own community and making things more accessible for all. Sale Disability Network Upper Peninsula logo, picture of UP in orange with blue paint circle. Sale Accessibility Consultation Services, Access for All logo. Green and blue words titled Access with exclamation point at end, for all underneath. www.upsale.org forward slash accessibility forward slash.